welcome to Surviving Show Business, the podcast that takes you inside entertainment to help you survive and thrive with your host, Aaron Seals. Surviving Show Business is sponsored by NYCastings.com, the place where stars are born. Actors, models, dancers, and singers can join and get casting notices sent to your phone every day. Welcome, folks, and today's show is all about directing, writing, and being a showrunner. Or, in other words, everything you need to know about getting uh, a TV show or a film to to become a live thing. Uh, my guest today is Jeff Fisher, and OK Magazine calls Jeff Hollywood's next big thing. Uh, he's worked on shows like Keeping Up with the Kardashians, The Simple Life, Real Housewives of Atlanta, Dance Life with Jennifer Lopez, and then films where he was the director, My Christmas Love on Hallmark, and Killer Reality on Lifetime. Welcome, Jeff. Hey, Aaron. It's uh, great to be here. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Glad to have you. So I want to start with uh, your TV work and all the different kinds of producing and writing roles that you've played in these various shows. Um, so tell me, how do you get to be a showrunner on a show like Keeping Up with the Kardashians? Huh. Um, well, it's a great, great question. <laughs> I, mm-hmm. but I'd have to think, have to think about it for a second. Um, but actually, uh, you know, I, I had made, uh, short films. Yeah. I, I went to always wanted to work in this industry, went to film school, had zero idea how to, how to break into it. Um, what, I, films, I, what film school was that by the way? Oh, I, I went to uh, Columbia college in Chicago. I, I did two years at university of Florida. I'm originally from Florida and I, uh, I transferred to uh, Columbia College in Chicago, which had a, a cool, like hands-on, uh, hands-on film program, and was honestly like a great. Growing up in suburban, uh, you know, South Florida, it was a great kind of benign intro to the big city. So, uh, okay. I'm grateful I did that. Okay. Um, um, yeah, and, and honestly, from from uh, from from there, I. Uh, I, I really, uh, once I had the degree, I mean, I, I knew I, you know, loved it and I learned how to get a bunch of, uh, equipment uptown on the L train, you know, which was, seemed like the, uh, hardest, uh, hardest production hurdle to get over at the time. <laughs> then figuring, figuring out how to, uh, actually get into the industry was, was kind of the next, next piece of the puzzle. The to next figure problem. Out how to do it. Okay. Yeah. So where, where was your beginning? So I went down my, my, uh, my mom was still living in South Florida and they were filming a movie down the street from her condo, this movie called arrive alive. Uh, and it, uh, and really there weren't, yeah, it, it, there, there weren't a, a ton of productions going on in South Florida at the time. It's just like, you should just, you know, you should stop by and tell them that you, you know, went to, went to film school and, and see, and see if you have any luck. So I didn't, I didn't have anything to lose. It seemed very scary at the time, but I knew enough to ask who, for, for the AD, like from what I, you know, what I, what I learned in undergrad. And, um, I, I did. I, 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 I looked, followed the walkies and I, um, I, I found a, a guy who I looked at happened to be the first AD and I said, Hey, I just, you know, got out of film school. Literally, you know, is, is there anything you need on set? And he told me to, to wait there for five minutes, which I looked out with that answer. I think I waited there eight hours, but I was so excited to like, kind of like watch a real, a real, you know, scaled show, um, being shot. It was a romantic comedy with Willem Dafoe and Joan Cusack. It's just, <laughs> if you can imagine that combo. Um, anyway, uh, it, it turns out they needed help in the craft service department. The next day they were shooting at the Miami Seaquarium and I was the fourth assistant in the craft service department. My job was literally to sweep up the, the chicken bones after, after the extras like box lunches on this show, but, and like in the middle of summer in Florida wow. and ah. it, it was, uh, it was not a, a, what I would consider a glamorous job, you know, but it was, I was so excited just to be on set and actually have a, you know, a job in the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, like for whatever reason, I, I won't comment on it, but you know, those days you used to have to mail back, you used to have to ship back film. You'd ship back dailies in this case from, um, from South Florida to, to, uh, Hollywood to where Paramount w- was in, in Los Angeles. And by the time daily started making it back, um, I didn't think, I don't think the, 
that that movie was uh, for whatever reason they pulled the plug after eight days of of shooting uh, that that uh, that movie and um the and the production shut down. But bummer. The the guy that was uh, running the craft service department, I think he saw that I was like I was willing to hustle and do whatever whatever I could. He said, "Hey, look, there's another job coming to town. They can't afford me, but." They, uh, but you know, maybe, you know, you can go do the craft service job for them. I think they, they were paying like two fifty a week, which after taxes, it was like, remember my paycheck was like $201 and 40 cents for like, you know, what seemed like a hundred hour work week. But again, I was, uh, a psyched to do it. And that, that's kind of how I, uh, those were, <laughs> that was my start. <laughs> that, was, that was my, my, uh, my, my start in the, uh, in the industry. Great. So wh- when did things pick up? Sure. Uh, well, I so I, um, I ended up looking out and I, I again, I hustled on that job and then ended up connecting the dots. And they, they were shooting um, Cape Fear down in South Florida mm. and they needed um, I, I had followed the producers of that show of the, the second show I did back to New York and, and met a couple of people. Again, I, I did a, a short gig where I was like kind of assistant to the producers. And I think and, and I ended up trying to do, you know, I, I always tell young kids that are, that are starting out, anybody trying to get into the industry, no matter what your job is, just like do the best, if it, even if it's sweeping up chicken bones, just do the best possible job you can do on that and ask what else needs to be done. You know, I feel like if you have a good attitude and a good work ethic, that's, you, it really will like open the door to future gigs. So, so anyway, um, I ended up looking out, I got to keep fear. They needed an assistant, like an, basically a temporary assistant for Mr. De Niro until his, uh, his regular assistant got down to prep. And I, I got that, I, I got that gig, which was, I was so lucky to see people like at that level of their career, you know, uh, uh, st- working in that level of professionalism and that caliber of, of cast and crew. Um, and I ended up getting to stay on that job when his assistant got there. And I was basically like the, for lack of better terms, kind of like a, a video assist PA. I would like really, I would wrangle all the, uh, the equipment and hook it up to the, um, camera and make sure that like the video village was, uh, w- was set up. But it, it gave me like amazing proximity to like, you know, a filmmaker like Mr. Scorsese and like Freddie Francis, who was the DP at the time and those great actors. And I just, kept my mouth shut and watched and listened. And, uh, um, that that is quite a jump from being the chicken bone cleanup guy. It was, it was, (laughs) man. I'll tell you, it, you know, there, there was a little, there was a little hustle between those two gigs, but it was, it was pretty, uh, it was pr- pretty fast. Now, now, mind you, I I packed up my car after Cape Fear and drove out to L.A. and I thought, oh, I, I just got off a Scorsese a Scorsese flick. I'm going to, uh, you know, I'll get a job in L.A. No problem. Meanwhile, I think uh, you know a month into it, I'm folding shirts at Banana Republic. You know, trying to figure out how to uh, how to get a job in in L.A. and um, ended up uh, finally got a like three days a week at this commercial production house and just uh, worked worked up from that and that that the guy that was the the dp it was a husband and wife uh team and this gentleman his name was rolf kesterman he was the uh director of photography at this commercial place called strato films and um he had just shot uh, like Chris Isaac's Wicked Game video, Janet Jackson's Love Will Never Do uh, video. And it was that gorgeous kind of like um, black and white photography. You know, it w- they shot it in color, like would overexpose the color film and undercrank the camera. And then in the telecine, they would push it to black and white. And those were the first time, Aaron, I, I don't know if you remember those videos, but like. I do. I, I love it, Wicked Games. Yeah. It's a great beautiful. song. Like, just, great yeah, video. It, Great. Yeah. It just, just the skin tones and it was so like sexy and that use of black and white. And remember like Rolf taught me that, you know, while black and white film had really not changed that heck of a lot between, you know, when it was invented and, you know, o- over the 50 years since color film was always getting, um, 
was always coming out with like new stocks and new ways to like, you know, capture the light. When you took that and you suddenly had the ability to push that to black and white in a telecine, you got these amazing kind of, uh, this amazing, like rich, saturated, like black and white look. Anyway, so I, I learned a ton from them and Rolf did me a huge friggin' favor and he shot my first, I, I'd made short films in, in film school, but, um, I, he, he shot this like spec music video that I, that I directed, which, you know, I, I literally like had the, what I felt like was like the best cinematographer on the planet, you know, helping me do this little picture, uh, music video. And, um, that, that was kind of like the first thing that I did that was kind of on, on like, I felt like on a, on a pro grade, you know? And then from that, um, put it, put two short films on my credit cards that felt like they were never going to get paid off, watched, you know, hustled them around to all the different film festivals, always hoping that, you know, Oh, I want a film festival. Someone's going to give me a job. You know, I did this. It's just, you know, <laughs> just, just trying to talk people into doing it. And, Ultimately, the first people I was able to talk into doing it were in the in the in the reality, uh, you know, film world. I, um, I I was working as an assistant at ICM as a talent ag- at the talent agency, you know, putting these short these like a, I put a thirty minute romantic comedy and then a, a you know a shorter musical romantic comedy on my on my credit card and didn't know how the heck I was going to pay it off. Um, Okay, so and, uh, that, that time period, that's when you really started getting your production chops in order with that production company. And then at ICM, you were making good connections there. Yeah, yeah, Aaron. I, I, I'd been in LA a couple of years and I'd PA'd on a bunch of different shows like The Shadow and, you know, I, I was I was PAing. And then one, one thing I – and then I got into casting. I loved – casting and i i thought that um i you know, loved working with actors and i figured that that was going to be a great way to uh to um uh i don't know like recognize recognize young actors and and through through that i, I lucked out and there was a, a talent there was a a guy named jack gelardi who was like an evp at at, at icm and my uh, my friend rick was working for him rick, rick wanted to be a writer he is a you know, he's done great now, but it, he went and worked for some writers leaving an opening at, of, of this job at, at ICM. And, um, I, I looked out cause Jack would package a lot of indie movies at ICM. And I was so up on, I, I loved young talent and I really knew a lot of, you know, I, I could look at the ta- at the, um, client list at ICM and really give Jack um, like deep casting lists on who at the, you know, at the company would, would make these indie movies shine. So I became a, I think I was a little bit of, of value to him more than, you know, just answering the phones and all the other things talent agents assistants do, you know? So I, I looked out and, um, I, I, I think, I think Jack included, uh, me and, 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 uh, honor who was the other assistant at, at the desk on, uh, on, on more things than maybe, uh, we would have regularly been included in. So, um, a- anyway, sorry. So, so, but yes, that, that's when things started to come together. And, and, and I, my, my long roundabout way of saying after a couple of years in LA, I started realizing that people I met that had really achieved a certain level of success, either as an executive or, you know, so, so, or in the creative, um, world had the common, um, history of working at a, at a talent agency. Um, and, and I, even though I was a little older, I think at that point I was 24, 25, I like, I, I started as an assistant at, at, at ICM and, um, and, uh, that, that was like kind of the next step there. Great. Now, somehow you got, somehow you, you got, uh, into the reality TV explosion cause you're in the early stages of it. I, I did. I did. So that, that is thanks to my friend, Tony Gallagher, who's currently show running a uh, real housewives of Be- Beverly Hills or, uh, you know, an EP on there and has since the beginning, Tony was like one of the two names I had in my pocket when I moved to LA, she was, a, she had gone to Northwestern with my friend, Andy, who's a good friend of mine in Chicago. And, um, 
Tony had, was out in LA for a couple of years before me. And, um, she, she had been great. I could call her and uh, she would photocopy and send me pages from the Hollywood creative directory. Anyway, she had wound up on real, on one of the first couple of seasons of real world and then road rules. And during her break from one of those shows, she did a show called, um, bug juice, which was about kids in summer camp for the Disney channel. And she needed a story editor. Uh, to come work with her. And Tony and I had tried writing a couple of scripts together when I got to LA and I had no idea what a story editor did, but I knew it was paying me more than I was making at the agency. And I, I really needed to pay, make more than the minimum payment on the, of these short films on those credit cards. So, um, I went and worked with Tony on that and the company that did that ended up hiring me to work on big brother after that. And mm-hmm. I kept, um, Bugging, the, bugging the EPs and the you know the the network people to please look at my short films and I, I finally got uh um you know I'm truncating the timeline but I, I got a job directing a, a show for MTV called Sorority Life and that was kind of my first um paid directing gig and, and that was in the in the reality world. Okay, great. So what uh, what what's it like being a director on a reality show? Dude, it's, it's, it's changed so much. You know, when I, when I started and I was at Buna Murray, like literally you were just going with your gut, like, okay, I'm going to be, I'm going to have better story if I follow Trishel and Mike than if I stay, you know, at the house with Coral or whatever, you know, actually Coral, <laughs> Coral is always pretty good dramas, but you know, you, you'd, so you'd go with your gut, you'd see what stories were developing and literally you weren't supposed to like move a shirt. If, if a shirt was on the floor and you need to like step on it, you were supposed to just, it was just about your gut and you would interview at, about, you know, stories that you saw, um, developing and just figuring out what's going to make the, you know, most sense to follow. Um, once the Hills and Laguna Beach came out, it was much more kind of, you know, you're asking at some point you're asking, you know, non-actors to, you know, to make, you know, hit beats or make emotional turns or, or you know, hit their light. Um, it became much more of this of this hybrid. Um, but it, still still today, you know, I, I think I think they run run the gamut um, of of levels of of you know being scripted or or unscripted but um Mm -hmm. it not 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 a great not a great answer to your question but aaron probably like you do when you're when you're making your projects you know you you set up your scenes you figure out you know what cameras are going to get you the best coverage you're going you look for you know get the best best cutaways you make especially in reality you got to make sure just as important as having the person talk you need the shots of of people listening, you know, which, cause in, in reality, you're so much shooting for, um, you're shooting so much more content, uh, because, you know, knowing that you're gonna, you're gonna truncate it in the edit and really find your, your story in the, in post, you know, a, a lot of the time. So, um, it, it, it's really making sure you have all the, all the tools you need for, for post-production to bring the projects together. Okay. So l- let me ask you this. You, You've been on a lot of shows. Name me some of your favorite shows and what role you played. Because on your resume, I see co-executive producer, showrunner. I see supervising story producer. I see director. You played a lot of different roles. Can you decipher these different positions for me? Sure. Um, Well, I mean, Simple Life was definitely one of my favorites. I could literally watch Harris and Nicole walk around up parking lot and stay entertained and i think i did literally watch them walk around the parking lot and what was entertained but i, I used know, to watch I, that show myself i really liked it, it, really liked it. yeah i know it, it was great you know and I, I loved you know as a kid i loved one of my favorite movies when i was a kid was the poseidon adventure i just loved it and i would beg you know my uh beg my parents to take me to see it when it whenever it would would come out again but I think that everyone was dressed so inappropriately. They were so over that, that the, in that movie, the boat flips over on new year's Eve. So everyone's dressed on new year's Eve and they have to go through this, you know, 
the, this disaster, like in, you know, in high heels, short skirts and tuxedo that tops, you know, and um, it is so funny. I think Simple Life brought a little of that because like Paris and Nicole were always like kind of dressed to the nines and looks great. And they'd have to be at a like at a funeral home or a, uh, you know, or a, an auto mechanics place or, you know, places that were or a, a convenience store, you know, dressed, uh, dressed inappropriately. I don't know. I found so much. uh I found so much uh, one of funny my, in that. One of my favorite things in that show was uh, they were on a dairy farm one day and they were like uh, talking about the milk and they're like, uh, who drinks this milk? And then the guy's like, people drink the milk. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, uh, my, my favorite thing was season one because like Paris and Nicole were in Altus, Arkansas. And like, and, but it was very, and this was 12 years ago, Walmart wasn't the thing it was today, but going to Walmart was a huge, it was a big talking point with the family when we go to Walmart. And Paris didn't understand the concept of Walmart. She's like, why is everyone so into Walmart? What is it? What do they do there? They they sell walls? Like she thought it was (laughs) was the greatest greatest piece of funny. But, you know, look, those, those ladies were super smart and they definitely knew funny and they, uh, you know, I think certainly one of the reasons for that show's success is that those those girls were good at comedy and they kind of uh they they uh they 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 made the they made the most of it but um so so on a show like that i i was i i directed like like come season uh three i would start in the field i think i directed the first half dozen episodes you you have multiple directors on that show so i i would uh, and you'd usually leapfrog um onto the day somebody would be prepping the work beat while like i would be doing the the family beat um uh, and you would you know you drive the show you're, you're working with a lot of uh you know people that it's their first time being put on camera a lot of times the families that would go so it's a lot of you know making them feel comfortable finding out what's organic in their in their day and trying to make them as comfortable in front of the camera as possible to you know to to do what what uh you know what to to go about their their daily life with a with a huge you know crew following them around um and then it, the supervising story producer in that, you know, you, you're in that case, I'm working, you know, for the I- executive producers, but I, I run the story department. So we would know what, you know, the conceits are. This is going to be this family and this episode and their job is going to be working at the advertising agency or working, you know, uh, you know, at, 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 you know, this, you know, th- this auto mechanics or, or whatever. And, you would – my team and I would call through the footage, certainly on the stuff I had, I had you know, directed in the field. I could say, oh, this this was really funny. This beat – you know, this played great. This came out great. And you you truncate down probably like a 10 to 1 ratio of, you know, footage to, you know, to content and just try – it's it's similar to, to scripted now. I think, you know, you find the eight scenes – that are that are your strong that tell the story of your A story in the strongest way, and you find the four scenes that tell your B story in the best possible way. Uh, Simple Life, we didn't have interviews. You know, a, a lot of times in other reality shows, you use confessionals or interviews to kind of to to help move the narrative along or drive your story. Simple Life was much more of a, a sitcom format in that the we didn't have any of those those tropes to tell it. So you really were just looking at the strongest scenes and I think sometimes we relied on a, a narrator, um, uh, like we had, a uh, to, to push it forward. But, um, so, so those, those were how those, those two jobs kind of, uh, shook, shook out on there. Got it. Now, have you created any, any TV shows? Do I, you know, I've got, I've had pitches I haven't, and, and I've, you know, I've shot, um, sizzles, uh, you know, to, to pitch, but I, um, I, I have not, I have not sold the show to, to be, I, I, to, to be complete, to completely honest, as grateful as I am for the, um, for the reality, you know, jobs I had and the great experience they gave me, I always wanted to get back into more kind of traditional narrative, like, 
every time I would wrap a show like Simple Life, I would go and shadow on a scripted episodic show or I'd be meeting with people trying to get, you know, get the financing for a, for a feature. So I think maybe the bandwidth that I could have put into trying to create a reality show for, for me, I, I was trying to spend that time uh, writing screenplays, raising money and, and trying to prove to people that I could, I could do uh, you know, straight narrative too. Cause th- those, th- those, f- even when I was doing great shows that were, you know, considered big hits, the stuff that, I personally was still proudest of were, were the short films, you know, cause I, right. I felt like those were stories that, um, I just was really excited about telling. Okay. So the reality stuff that was largely production type roles, you made money that way and that's good. Let's move on to your film stuff. Um, your biggest hit, I guess was my Christmas love on Hallmark. Yeah, that, that was, that, that did really well for Hallmark and I, I really liked it. I mean, but, and uh, a note that was the highest rated uh, film of 2016 for Hallmark. Yeah, right? very, yeah, very, very proud of that. And you know, it was it was a great team, and Meredith and Bobby and and the Aaron and Megan and Greg. They were, the cast was awesome, you know. So, uh, but, but yeah, that, we had a lot of fun. I got to sneak some musical numbers into that movie. It was. <laughs> it was uh, it was good. We had we had, a, we had a really good time. Now you were the director on that. You didn't write it. Uh, how did you get that gig as the director? Um, I had done so. So my first feature was a movie called called Killer Movie uh, with Kaylee Cuoco and Paul Wesley. That was kind of like my first uh, kind of big like long form na- narrative narrative movie. Um, and off you, that, you, you were the writer and director on that. I wrote, yeah, I wrote, I wrote that and directed it. And that was like, oh my God, that was born out of crazy film. But, you know, Kaylee plays a character named Blanca Champion in that movie. That's kind of loosely based on, on Paris. It, it was, it was, uh, it was me kind of like taking all the crazy stuff I'd seen on reality TV, uh, uh, sets and putting it in a blender or putting it all together and coming out with kind of like a, 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 a wannabe, uh, scream kind of comedy horror movie, uh, and so, you got the idea from just being a reality producer. It was the I, I the, did. The it, it was that. It was that. one particularly crazy job that really gave me. Which we were up in. Uh, we were up in like the you know n- near the the Canadian border in the middle of winter, and it was just it was just. And it, clearly, the townspeople didn't didn't like the idea of a reality show being there. And I just my I was housed like in this half winterized cabin out in the woods and literally i would like uh just with coyotes howling and no internet service and you know and and, uh, no no internet no no cell service and i would just lay awake thinking of every horror movie that i that terrified me when i was a kid like friday the 13th and halloween and everything and i Mm -hmm. um and i uh i started uh, you know, I started this idea of what if what if things went terribly wrong on this reality show? And just as as I uh, as I started writing it, I just started drawing on, you know, all the experiences of all these other shows. And again, the tropes of making reality TV and sometimes the very funny and sometimes the, you know, the the hard to palate stuff came through. And I, I how long did it take you to write that? That's script. Okay. Dude, I was really determined to write that. I, cause I, I was really like itching to do something that wasn't in the reality TV world. So I got up, I was shooting Dance Life, that, uh, the J Lo show. And, um, I'd made myself get up, I think at 4 a.m. every morning before we'd go, before we'd go shoot. And I made myself write for two and a half hours. I, I think I, I think I, knocked out the first draft of killer movie which was called dead of winter when i wrote it in two two months now mind you it was a shitty first draft it was terrible you know but but i think i i got it to where um it was readable probably in about three three months time and um i think we were shooting it i actually got it financed and we were shooting it within like 12 to 15 months it was i was it was i was it was it, it was just not not giving up on a very Sisyphean uh, in, in endeavor, but um, okay. Now, what was the budget for that, and how did you raise that money? 
Uh, it's a great question. Our budget was one eight. I think it was just under two million with the the incentive we got from the state of Minnesota at the time. Um, I had no idea how to how to raise money for it. I like I boy was I wishing instead of taking classes in French New Wave cinema, I was I had <laughs> got taken some MBA classes because um, I went to one of my you know best friends from college, uh, my my buddy Mark. He, uh, he had moved to New York and he'd done really well for himself on, on wall street. And that kind of that investment banking and investment language was kind of his first language. And he talked me through a business plan or like how I could draft a business plan that would have a, a high return on like that was a high risk investment and what the, you know, the ROI, the return on the investment would have to be for a, for a high risk stuff. And I, that was, and I, we had that conversation before I started writing the movie because at the time the remakes, it, as far as box office goes, the remakes of Halloween, Friday the Thirteenth, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the Scream movies, the Saw movies, they were having these insane opening weekends for movies that didn't have the hugest budgets. You know, they were having forty million dollar opening weekends on production budgets that could be like around ten, and um. I thought, okay, and, and I at that point I, had, the people that had made my short films with me, I mean, DP, costume designer, you know, uh, a bunch of uh, casting director, they had all gone on to like do really great stuff, and we were still friends, and they were still open to, you know, working with me on my first feature. So my my hope was that I could make a two million dollar movie that looked like a ten million dollar movie and open it, open it, you know. And that it would open big in that genre. So um, that that's a uh, so so anyway. So I, I took Mark's advice. I, I took a um, a genre that seemed like it would perform really well, uh, and I tried to you know put a spin on it, and, like make it like and do something that I hadn't seen before, which in this case was like kind of like behind the scenes of how you make reality TV and. Um, certainly a, a something that I knew and had some issues to work out in, you know, and, um, and, uh, yeah, and it, you, you know, we wrote it and shot it and learned, a learned a hell of a hell of a lot, both about the business of, of filmmaking and, you know, and why it's not a great idea to have, you know, uh, 26 locations <laughs> in, a, in a, you know, in a, in a, in a 20 day shoot and how, how much, you know how 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 much uh, bandwidth it eats up to try to figure out where to park the trucks and you know and and right. make make all these location moves in one day. But now, I still, getting back to how did you get the money? So so I'm sorry. So so Mark helped me uh, do the business plan, and then it became like the journey of a thousand no's. Literally, I would you know I it was it's such an awkward question to ask. You know, do you know somebody right. who wants to invest in a film? Mark really helped me by giving me, by kind of being the first money in, he was, uh, you know, it was amazing. He, he made an initial investment. He, um, helped me set up conference calls with some other people in that investment banking world. Um, two more of his colleagues at different kind of, uh, uh, in the banking industry were in. And at that time I started connecting the dots to different, uh, venture capitalists. Um, and pitching and literally whatever, if I had to like finish work and go pitch somebody's, you know, pinch somebody at a, like a karaoke bar in Burbank whose like son wanted to, to, you know, get, get an acting break, whatever. I just, I, I just would, I just would pitch and pitch and get, you know, some people were interested. Some people were hard nosed. Some people were maybes. And I learned that the, that the, you know, the yeses were obviously amazeballs, um, but it, it made most time to 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 try to finesse the people that that were, or you know, move forward with the people that were at least at the maybe mark. Because getting somebody from like a hard no to a yes was a was a really tough sell. So I started focusing on that. And, How much uh, did the uh, the casting play into that? Were they having opinions on who, what, what actors they wanted to see? Like, how did that part go? Yeah, man, it was. It's a great question. So I, there was a there was a production company um, 
was a sales company that read the script and they said, okay, yeah, we, we like it. If you can raise half the money, um, we'll give you the other half to make it. And it's, I'm cutting a bunch of stuff out, but I, I basically I did. I, I raised half the budget and that, and they wouldn't give me casting lists. They wouldn't give me who they wanted for casting. And then when I did reach the halfway point, they gave me their casting list and I mean, I mean, zero disrespect to these actors. It just wasn't the vision for my movie. They, to get it made, they wanted – like they, they would give you these three equal a green light. So it was Udo Kair, um, Keith Carradine, and Dominique Swain was the, was the top of their list. Hmm. And at the time, I was like, fine. There were two coaches, old, you know, coaches that were like these guys in their, you know, whatever, like – you know, early fifties. I'm like, it's fine. You know, Keith Carradine and Udo Kair are great. I'm like, that's going to get your movie made. They wanted them for the like young leads, like Paul Wesley, who was 25 at the time and was playing. They got ended up playing the guy they wanted Keith Carradine for. And I just thought, I'm like, man, I don't even want to see that movie. I don't understand, you know, like how to, how to make this work. So I, I went back to the investors that I'd got the half. And um, my friend, Steve Brooksbank, who I'd worked with, um, in casting before we had, we had started casting the, um, uh, one of the investors had released, uh, cause, cause the way the, the fundraising worked, you couldn't spend any of the money until you were whole. So like if we got to half and then the sales agency kicked in, you know, or you could do that, or if you were fully funded, but you couldn't spend, uh, obviously any of the, um, initial investment, um, until, until you raise the entire budget that was agreed upon. But one of the investors gave us a relief because we were trying at the time, the movie was called dead of winter and we were trying to shoot in that season. So he released uh, like a small increment of the investment so we could start location scouting, hire a location scout there and start casting. And during that, that period, you know, we had found, like Paul and Kaylee and Leighton Meester and, you know, a bunch of, you know, other great young actors that had gone on tape and were just so kind of special and, you know, had such kind of luster to them. So anyway, I cut those, that kind of dream list of who we wanted. And, and I had done a bunch of due diligence with friends that worked in studio marketing or at studios and they were telling me the same thing. Like, look, the star of a horror movie, honestly, is the genre. You know, you're not – it's yeah. not an actor-driven thing. It, it's it, – the star of the movie is the horror movie. So you're better putting the best possible actors in there than, you know, chasing either actors that are established and won't do it, you know, or people that are just going to – I don't know, like, you know, change what you think when you, when you, when you look at the cast list. So – this, I really owe it all to the investors. I went back, I cut like the auditions of, you know, our top choices and said, look, here's what we found out. We think these kids are going to make, you know, the movie so much more special. And they almost across the board doubled their investments. So they went from halfway wow. investing all the way to the top and we just were able to make it with our cast. Now, we shot the movie, I think, in 2007 through Network Upfronts. We had a 20-day shoot, which was seems very luxurious now, but uh, we had a 20-day shoot through Upfronts. We lost six of our cast to Upfronts for five days because all their shows got picked up. Kaylee's Big Bang Theory got picked up. Gossip Girl got picked up for Leighton. Uh, Nestor had a show called uh, Kane at the time. He went on to, you know, he'd done a bunch of great stuff. He was in my short films already. But anyway, and like, obviously, and then Paul got Pretty Little Liars. Uh, Paul got Vampire Diaries. Tori got Pretty Little Liars. They, they all started popping out. Rob, Rob Buckley took over One Tree Hill. So I ended up with a cast, you know, A, that I loved when we were going, and, and B, a couple of years down the line, we're on, you know, these these ginormous hit hit shows. Yeah. So how did, how did it all play out? Uh, well, did it started. You have, did you have to jiggle dates around? Like, how did you end up no. making it work? Oh, we just shot through. Yeah, we just we just had to rejigger the studio, the um, the schedule, and change the locations. And um, you know, we just we just shot. We knew the days. The, the networks had different upfronts they were on different days so we just um 
you know, when Kaylee was gone, there were no Kaylee scenes when, you know, late, late in, in and out of the movie pretty quick. So that wasn't, uh, that wasn't, a an issue. We just, we just, we just moved the schedule around to accommodate. And obviously they were, it was really exciting for them, you know, getting shows picked up. So I think the energy was, you know, that much, that much higher on the set when they came back. So, um, we just made it work. I just, you know, I, I thought I worked really hard on that script to be honest. My, my, and, and I, and I do love that movie. If I have a couple of martinis and watch it, I, <laughs> I really, I really uh, enjoy it. But, um, what, um it, how did it play out with distribution? Like where did that end up going? So, we got, we got really lucky. We got into opening night of the Tribeca Film Festival in 2008. We were really excited. Um, and at, I think a couple of the shows had, had already premiered. I think Big Bang already premiered and Gossip Girl already premiered at that point. And um, there was good buzz. There were – at the time, the agency I had at the time said, you got to sell this movie before it leaves the festival. That's the way to play this. I, I, you know, and I hadn't been through this process before. We did it. We went with a smaller company that this was the movie seemed like it was going to be get a lot of attention for. I, I think and it was supposed to come out Halloween 2008. I think the company went bankrupt <laughs> on in September of 2008 by the way selling a movie in 2008 was about as much fun as selling a condo not that fun but uh and so it was like such a high and then such a you got to be kidding me and i think it got they sold the movie into a to a canadian into a canadian dvd library it was just it was tough wow. it was a it was a i was um it, it was who knows maybe killer movie one day <laughs> we'll get it <laughs> We'll get it wider, 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 uh, some more eyeballs on it. But it it was not, it was not a a a distribution dream at the end. At the end of the day, it ended up, you know, making its money back. But it was a long, uh, long, um, it's been a long process. Got it. So where did you go from there? Got it. So from killer movie, I think I found myself. And after that endeavor, I think I found myself working on the pilot of real housewives of Atlanta. Right. And, and, and I had had a really good education in what it meant to film in an incentivized location because we had shot killer movie in Minnesota for that reason. And Atlanta, I had a good friend that was working in the mayor's office and the economic development office in Atlanta that was real. And Atlanta was really getting serious about their tax credit. Um, and I started getting really interested because I thought that they, they wanted to pass a 30% tax credit, which they ultimately did. And I thought if they pull that off down here, this place is going to explode. So I, um, while I was working on uh, real, real housewives, I, uh, um, before I went back, I had an interview at Turner. I had a buddy working at Turner down here, and I had an informational meeting with a couple of people there. It ended up, uh, and I went off to do another show for the CW after that, and I was in DC, and I got a call from that, one of the recruiters that was in that Turner meeting, that they were moving this kind of in-house EP director um, job from LA to Atlanta. And asked if it was something that I was interested in, and I had had some good friends and family, and you know, high school friends that were living in Atlanta, and um, and I was kind of beat up after the killer movie experience, to be honest. And this seemed like consistency and a kind of a fresh start. So um, I did that. I, I ended up, you know, working. I I got I ended up looking out. I got that job, um, and I was making content in house for Turner. Uh, and I, I, I stayed down in Atlanta for three, um, three years and I was now, getting, uh, just quickly, sorry. what were some of the shows that you, that you made at that time? Dude, it was, it was really interesting. It was, so my, my gig was in, it was, it was in brand, they, it was branded content. So I was doing these branded shows that like, um, one was called my Manny. The other was called Jillian in Georgia and they were co-ventures um, between TBS and like big companies like Walmart or Disney theme parks or Chevy. 
And they would air as what was called like a series within a series. I know this sounds a little weird to wrap your head around, but um, so if you were Chevy and you wanted to um, get 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 eyeballs on the new Chevy Traverse, and specifically you thought the the people you were having trouble re- reaching were were like. Um, african-american moms right and and uh tbs had a show like that had a lot of those eyeballs you would chevy would get every commercial break during the show for uh, a two-week flight and you would launch it as a series within a series and if so they were watching a family comedy this show was a family comedy and it would air within the body of the other show it's a really interesting concept and an interesting thing to learn um that's basically how it how it worked. There were different ways to get, you know, branded uh, branded content in there. Wow. So uh, let's let's jump up to my Christmas love. Your biggest success, I guess, in directing. How did that come about? Sure, sure uh, I got it. So I had done um, off killer movie. I got killer reality for a company called it was, that was called The Bachelor to Die For. I think when we shot it, but I, off this company, uh, Mar Vista. And had a good experience with them on that. And Mar Vista was also in the business of doing uh, Hallmark Christmas movies, you know, Christmas movies. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, my Christmas love came out. The guy that was the executive at um, Mar Vista was a guy named Larry Grimaldi, who was a friend of mine for 20 years. And we had always hoped to work together. And this project um, uh, seemed like a good uh, a good fit. So I, I, I had the, it, you know, I had the, experience with um uh mar vista um i was lucky and hallmark approved me off the you know off the off the previous movies and um we went off to utah a couple of years ago and um probably around two years ago at this this time and and shot uh and shot um my christmas love which i think was we had a 15 day shoot uh in uh the end of August and did our best to make Park City and Salt Lake look like, uh, like Christmas. <laughs> I think we pulled, I think we pulled it off. Uh, the poor actors had a lot of sweaters and a lot of warm coats on when it was hot out, but they were, uh, they were, uh, gamers. So. Cool. Yeah. Uh, what about, what about the, uh, the cast of that? How did they come about? Um, let's see. Meredith Hagner had, um, uh, she had done another Christmas, another, she was on, I, I want to say she's great. I, I want to say she was on as the world turns. She was on one of the existing soaps. She had been on there and she had already done a, 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 another Christmas movie and it popped onto Hallmark's radar. And, um, I don't know if she gotten, I don't believe she, she might've just gotten search party, but she was great. I saw her at David. She, she was one of the names on their approved list. And, you know, and she was a great comedian. She was super funny and I was excited to get to work with her. Same thing with Bobby Campo. Bobby had been on, on a, one of Hallmark's lists. I had seen him in scream the TV show. And I think final destination and, um, and they came on and then, same thing. Aaron O'Connell had done a couple of Hallmark movies. He ended up being great with comedy. Megan Park was a good friend of Meredith's, and Meredith actually recommended Megan. Um, and uh, yeah, and then Gregory Harrison, had, uh, who was great, had, had done a couple of those shows. So you have a you know on, on those in my experience, um, Hallmark does so many of these movies and. Uh, they, they have they have a, a list of people that they're um they're comfortable you know they're comfortable with and then and then obviously there are a bunch of supporting roles you try to find the you know best best people possible to you know make the the comedy or the story shine as you can but uh that, that that's that and I, I thought they did I love I loved that cast I thought they they really helped elevate the movie got it and. Actually, I think people can see the entire movie on your website, right? Oh yeah, I have to give them a, I have to give them a, uh, the password for for that. But yeah, <laughs> I, I was just watching it before we started. I was able to see the whole thing. So. Oh cool. Oh well, dude. Thanks for watching it. Uh, hopefully. I didn't watch the whole make- thing. I just skimmed through it um, to prep. But um, 
actually people can see it at uh, jefffisherdirector.com, correct? Ooh, yeah, that's my website. Thank you. Now, I got a question. You have to stay really busy because I see you have a big team. You have an agent, manager, PR guy. There's lawyers in the mix. Uh, what, what kinds of stuff do you do to, to keep the next gig coming in and feed feed everybody? Oh, dude, it's all, you know, it's it's uh, a hustle, man. Other than it, my it, my sweet radio show here. Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a. Uh, you know, it, it, it's just staying in touch with people. I literally, I try not to be, you know, I, I try to keep my eye on the timeline so I'm not being super annoying, but you know, it's that self promotion thing, boy, it's the hardest, it's the hardest, hardest part of this business, you know, cause you're selling yourself basically. But I, um, you know, I, I, I know the people, be, be it network executives or studio executives or uh, you know, production companies that I've worked with before and have, you know, good relationships. And I, I try to, you know, send really short emails or short phone calls to say, Hey, I'm just wrapping this up. You know, I'd love the chance for us to, to work together again. And then, you know, then I work on my own stuff, like trouble with angels, this, you know, the movie, um, it's a, it's a romantic comedy, it's a musical trying to get made it, it point my time into like writing, new content either myself or with Mike, Michael, my writing partner and, um, you know, reaching out, to ways to, to get those projects, you know, funded and, and greenlit. So it really is. It's, it's when I'm not working, my job is, you know, lining up, lining up the next one. It's, it's, uh, some days it's easier. <laughs> some days it's easier than others. You know, sometimes it's just, you really don't want to, bug somebody you're like oh my god when was the last time when was the last time i uh, i i annoyed this executive at the cw <laughs> See, you know is is enough time lapsed where uh where where it's it's appropriate to, to reach out but what uh what advice would you give to a person that wants to write their own film and then direct it and have it get produced um now that's a great question. Well, write it first. It's it's you know, and, and be easy on yourself. Just just get a terrible first draft out there first. Just get it down on on paper all the way through because it's so easy to go back and reread reread your previous day's work and think it's not good. You know, so but my my advice is to get get yourself a schedule. Like do your best to commit to a certain amount of time. You know, each day where you can like turn your internet off and, you know, set a timer and write for, write for an hour. And just, you know, even, even if that's all, you know, all, all you can put into it, which is fine and get through, get through that draft. Cause you, you really do want to have a, a piece of, of content that you believe in, you know, if, and if you haven't found that script that somebody else wrote, you know, then for me, I, I just, I tried to write it, write it myself. Um, and then go, start figuring out, is this something that I could shoot, shoot myself? Do I want to do this on a, you know, on a, on a shoestring budget just to get it down? Do I want to, you know, put together a crew and try to do a, like a proof of concept with it or, or, um, or do I know anybody that might want to be kind of like an angel investor here? Or is this something that I, you know, want to put on my own credit cards and get out there? It, I just, I, I feel like you had, the more whatever, if you direct something, if you write and direct something that you could show people, uh, then that's your strongest place to come from. Cool. Uh, I think that about wraps it up. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Like, uh, what do you got coming up? What's your next project? Uh, I just did another, uh, another movie, uh, another Christmas movie that'll be on this, uh, this Christmas called Christmas camp. About, uh, nice. about, uh, yeah, but it's about, um, great, uh, young actress named, uh, Lillianne Harrison. She basically plays this, uh, young woman who works at a, an ad agency who, uh, like her wheelhouse is like social media and everything that's kind of like hip and current. Um, but in order to get this promotion, she's got to land a, a toy company account. And this toy company is all about traditional Christmas, which is something she knows very little and honestly cares very little about. So uh, to get the chance to pitch this account, she makes a deal with her boss that she'll go to uh, basically Christmas boot camp 
like Christmas camp in upstate New England for a week and learn everything she can about, uh, about traditional Christmas. And she gets to the camp and the, uh, the, uh, owner of the camp has a good looking son and they're, uh, they're off to the races. It's very, uh, it's very, uh, hallmarky. I won't tell you how it ends out, but uh, I won't tell you how it turns out, but, uh, I bet, I bet you can imagine. Um, and, uh, yeah, and that, and I got another another uh, a romantic comedy that musical I'm talking about, which is called The Trouble with Angels, which um, I am uh, super excited about and hope to shoot in the very near future. Is that the one based off Angels Baby? It is. It is all these years in the making, but yeah, I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm not going to start. I'm not going to stop until uh, until we get this one uh, get this one out there. I, I really I really love that love this project. Cool. I think that'll do it for us. Where can uh, people get a hold of you at? Um, you can uh, you can always uh, you can contact me through my uh, my website, uh, social media on on uh, Instagram. I'm uh, Jeff La thirty three, and uh, and uh, I'm also uh, on Twitter. I think I'm at Jeff Fisher thirty three. Those two. Uh, so um, uh, would love to love to hear from anybody. And then again, jefffisherdirector.com is your website where people can see your work and all that jazz. Yeah, and then there's links to the to um, Instagram and Twitter on there as well. Cool. That'll do it. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Awesome. Thanks so much, Aaron. Great talking to you. Bye-bye. Well, that's all, folks. Surviving Show Business is sponsored by nycastings.com, the place where stars are born. Actors, models, dancers, and singers can join and get casting notices sent to your phone every day. 